Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Epic Chats. My name is Jennifer Shu, and I'm the head of US development at Epic Foundation. So at Epic, we fight to change the lives of disadvantaged children and youth around the world through our portfolio of high impact organizations. As always, our chat today will include an opportunity for all of you to ask our special guest your burning questions during the AMA. So as you think of them, please add them to the questions tab or upvote the ones that you want answered. And with that, over to you, Anita. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for, for joining from all over the world, I can see. Uh, so I'm Anita Kerbalani, I'm CEO of Epic. We're so excited today to welcome Rishi. Um, Rishi led Twitter's market entry to India and uh, is at the helm of Times Bridge, so you'll learn more about that real soon. Um, as a reminder today, for those who are uh, joining us for this first time, the EP, the Epic Pledge, is a promise to give a percentage of your success as an entrepreneur or as an investor for social good. And as you know, at Epic, we're all about giving back. So today, Rishi has chosen to support India's, uh, Epic's India's portfolio. As you all know, the situation in India recently has been really devastating with COVID, and now they've been recently hit with a cyclone. So we'd really love for you guys to join us. Um, in uh, helping uh, helping India. You'll see a pop-up somewhere on your screen above me um, that will open a separate donation window. So every donation counts. Please don't hesitate to join us. And most of all, enjoy this, uh, this great talk with Jennifer and, and Rishi. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Anita. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, so I'll dive right in. Uh, Rishi, as Anita mentioned, you launched Twitter in India, and actually later across Asia and the Middle East. And so there's usually a, an MBA textbook approach to market entry. And then there was your approach. And so I'd love for you to share more about that experience with our audience today. Great. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, thanks, Anita. Thanks, Alexandre, as well, for facilitating all of this. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to lend my voice to uh, all things India, particularly at a time like this. Uh, you know, I view India taking a step back as a microcosm of the world. In so many ways, um, you know, when I was living in India and I'd welcome visitors to India, I'd say, welcome to the world, not welcome to India. It's because every, every facet of the human condition exists in India at scale. Um, it's a continent unto itself. Uh, many people say there's sort of three countries within India. They got the UK, the Brazil, and, 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 and Sub-Saharan Africa, all sort of in one, one continent. Uh, separate, of course, from um, the digital conditions of the market, the faith or origins of faith in the country. Um, all of that is to say, when you think about market entry in India, you have to be mindful of its continental scale. And you have to be mindful of, you know, your the approach you learned uh, in a course way back uh, or in a PDF you may have downloaded off the internet. Uh, may, may be insufficient. Uh, my approach to the market was to find my way, find my company and my product and my mission's way into the culture. India is one of these markets where because of English, because of openness, and because of scale, I used to say, Jen, hashtag everybody's got a million users in India, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can launch virtually anything in the Indian market and it will do mm -hmm. well. It will look good on a slide for your board. But as the guy who helped bring Google to India, YouTube to India, Twitter to India, when you're actually in India, you see its continental scale. And you see that there's so much more uh, that the company or product could take on. Um, and so the question I always asked was not so much, how do I hit my first ceiling of growth in the market, which you can do with a little bit of product localization, a little bit of performance marketing, because India's got a gazillion Facebook users and you know, uh, internet users. Um, how do you find your way into culture? And so I built relationships from government to religion, from film and Bollywood to influence uh, on the internet, from sport and cricket to CEOs. Mm -hmm. And I found really novel ways for my product to resonate with as horizontally wide mm -hmm. a network of folks who lead culture in India. And I found that was a way for a product to endure. So that's kind of a quick version of how I think about India and how I think about market, how I've thought about market entry in India. Thank you, Rishi. Um, so a, a lesson in, in creative horizontal partnerships. I, I love it. 
Um, so today you're at the helm of Times Bridge, which is a, a venture firm that's bringing uh, really big ideas to India. Uh, your portfolio includes Airbnb, Headspace, House, Stack Overflow, Uber, um, and Coursera, which actually IPO'd earlier this year. So, so congratulations. Um, it's quite a few, you know, big names, global companies that um, you've helped bridge into the, the India market. And so, you know, what are some other lessons that you've learned in, in helping um, them uh, uh, expand there? And then, I guess to, to throw in sort of a more challenging question, um, some people would say, hey, why do you need these global companies going into India? They already, you know, India already has a really vibrant tech ecosystem. And so, you know, it, some people have asked, is this like a new form of colonialism? So <laughs> I'd love for you to, to share no, a little bit more about that. Great questions. I think the starting point is, Again, to take a step back, when I talk to founders and CEOs uh, and board members and investors around the world, when the puzzle pieces fit really, really nicely together around their inclination around India and Times Bridge, it's when they mm -hmm. see India three dimensionally, when they when they perceive India to not just be another market on a list uh, that value needs to be extracted from by this quarter but they see India as a three-dimensional center of value creation for their organization, a center of audiences, a center of revenue, a center of customer growth, a center of product innovation, right? Figuring things out in India teaches you a lot about how to figure things out in other markets, including Southeast Asia, uh, other parts of South Asia, and even East Africa. Um, do they see India as a center of organiz global organizational culture? Um, so I think at a big picture level, I really enjoy working with companies and the list of companies you, that Times Bridge works with are precisely those kinds of companies. Companies that see India cross-functionally, see India three-dimensionally. Um, and so as an example, Dara from Uber, the CEO of Uber, will often talk about India as not just a, a massive rides market for Uber, but a market that's also teaching Uber transportation mm -hmm. innovation because you have so many different kinds of transport in the market from auto rickshaws to commuter buses mm. uh, to of course Uber's bread and butter rides. And then Uber's, uh, India is also a, a major global engineering center for Uber. Uh, Uber builds products in India that they ship to other markets in the world. And you see that across our portfolio. And that was really the premise of Times Bridge. Five years ago, I thought I might start my own little consultancy to help folks reimagine India. And I was delighted to partner with the Times Group of India, which is India's oldest and largest media and digital company, to mm. build really sort of an investment operations platform that helps just a few purposeful companies a year. We also work with nonprofits um, like Girl mm. Effect, like Malaria No More, in helping them reimagine and uh, lead their India market entry. Um, and our, and that's, that's really the core of our value proposition. You know, I tell a lot of companies often, you don't need me to be present in India. You don't need Times Bridge to even do well in India. But if your inclination is to endure in India, well past, you know, uh, a multi-quarter framework you may have at your end, if your inclination is to sort of matter and mm -hmm. have cultural currency in India as a product or a cause, um, so that you're able to withstand um, when the world shifts, your, your product is able to withstand mm. um, which way the wind is blowing, that's mm. when you want to work with Times Bridge. If you want to find relevance in business culture, political culture, youth culture, entertainment culture. And so we invest in companies and have sort of strategic equity relationships uh, with them. And I'm, I'm really proud of the companies we've brought to India, all of whom are category leading uh, in the Indian market. But what I'll say to your last question there, which I think is a really good one around, you know, isn't there a local Indian ecosystem, right? There are, I, I know mm -hmm. there are people here joining from India, potentially founders in India, who are wondering, well, what about us? Uh, the government of India in recent years has spent a lot of time thinking about nurturing uh, the local uh, creative and entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is great. I think my perspective on it um, is that I think India is better and we're all what better when the world's best are are in India, right? I think I think mm. I think these ecosystems are connected. Uh, plenty mm. of local entrepreneurs uh, experience exits and raise money from global players who've 
uh, learned about India by virtue of companies uh, and bridges like Times Bridge. So I think we're all better and India is better when the world's best are in India, uh, raises, raises the bar for everybody. And, and that's really our hope, right? And, we're, and we are intentionally looking for companies that aren't in India for the flyby, right? There are many companies mm -hmm. that enjoy flying into Delhi and Bombay and speaking on a panel, or I guess a virtual panel now, and kind of planting a flag and declaring victory. Uh, unlike a China, you know, I don't know as much about China, but I, sus I suspect in China, you're a little bit more all or nothing uh, in terms of your market entry. India is a market where a lot of folks have been uh, okay to be half, half in the market, so to speak. Uh, so we look for companies that I think have soul and animate almost emotionally around India. And I think as a mm -hmm. result, do good things for the Indian ecosystem as a result of being present in the market. Thank you. And and I think this is a, a perfect segue. I'm actually going to kick up the uh, AMA a little bit earlier because I, I spotted a, a really good question to to build off of what you just shared. Sure. Um, which is, you know, there's a there's a really impressive portfolio um, that you've built at, at Times Bridge. Um, and so in the beginning, like how did these companies find you? So the companies that, you know, in your words, uh, aren't so fly by, but are really interested in, in building these uh, partnerships on the ground long term, you know, how did they find you and how did that initial conversation come up? And then uh, if I can be a little bit selfish, I'm a huge fan of uh, Headspace. And so sure. I'm curious, you know, if, if one of the examples can be around uh, how that conversation kicked up. Yeah, you know, it, it's extraordinary how much of this, and I, I didn't know this in advance, right? I mean, I had spent my career um, as an entrepreneur in the social sector and the tech sector, and as an executive and operator in the technology sector. I, I, I didn't know what it would be like to be kind of on the investment slash strategic partnership mm -hmm. side of the table. How does that work, right? How do you, how do yeah. you find people, literally, right? <laughs> how does this work? Um, and I guess what I was struck by and what I could continue to be struck by is how much relationships and reputation matters. Uh, when you develop a reputation for having been there, done that, as I've been blessed to, to, mm. to develop, um, there's a, you, you accumulate um, experience and um, a reputation that leads to really an inbound of, uh, of introductions and, and relationships. And, you know, particularly here in the US, and now you're seeing this in India as well, you're seeing a lot of folks go from company to company. So um, many of the folks at Company X uh, may have worked with me years ago at Google, or many of the folks at Company Y may have been at, been at Twitter at some point. So I guess on first blush, relationships and reputation really matters, and I'd encourage yeah. everyone in the audience. And I think for me, Jen, I've been really specific and pointed around my reputation, right? My entire career is really anchored in India and APAC. Um, right. Declaring one's major, right? Around what are you really, what do you stand for in career can be scary, but is essential, right? I'm, kind, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm a wide, I like to think of myself as a wide person with a variety of interests that you can't typecast. And so sometimes I get worried when someone says, you're the India guy, but on some level you have to embrace mm. it. Um, you have to embrace um, in your own context what you stand for. And I think mm -hmm. over a couple of decades now, I've developed a reputation in academic and nonprofit and technology circles of having a higher mm -hmm. order uh, concern and conviction around India, and that's led to relationship. It doesn't hurt, of course, that India just is one of the, it is the largest open digital market in the world. Uh, and so that helps. And then and then, of course, having in, in the backdrop of Times Bridge being the Times Group, a 200-year-old institution that produces everything from the world's largest newspaper, English newspaper, to the Oscars and Grammys of India, to the leading entertainment apps in the market, uh, leads to a pretty compelling hello with companies. And, and that's how it happened with yeah. Headspace, right? I mean, the folks at Head, what's amazing about Headspace is that Andy, the voice and co-founder of Headspace, um, was a was a monk, uh, a Buddhist monk in India for a decade. Uh, it's right. where he was when he started to cultivate his meditative practice. And mm -hmm. uh, I got introduced to Andy and the founders through a relationship uh, that, that uh, understood my reputation. And again, the conversation was less about the math of the market, though that matters, but it was more about one's um, 
mission as it relates to the market. Uh, these higher mm -hmm. order um, takes on the uh, on the Indian scenario, and I think we clicked and connected because we saw India with empathy and energy, not just as a place to show up. And, and so we're doing lots of cool things for Headspace. Headspace uh, particular, you know, entered the Indian market just before COVID. We've made Headspace free for a number of Indian universities in India. Mm. Uh, we now have Headspace integrated uh, in, in the Times Group subscription offerings. And we're hoping oh, soon to do a lot of work with Headspace with the healthcare community in India. Mm. Uh, so stay tuned there. That's great. Um, I know in the U.S. at least they uh, made Headspace free for educators and healthcare workers, yep. and so great to to see the same planned for for India. Um, and so I, I think this is a, also a good segue for uh, on, on the next MAM AMA question um, from Miriam. So, is there anything you've learned from scaling in India that you could ext extrapolate for the benefit of nonprofits we support in India? And that are listening today. So she says, "Wink, wink, Arun." Um, <laughs> so Arun is uh, CEO of Apnalaya, which is one of the uh, organizations in our portfolio that's that's working on the ground to to tackle the crisis. So Arun, shout out to you. Thank you for joining in. Um, and so, yeah, lessons learned for for nonprofits. Yeah, I mean, what I would say, I, I've spent about a third of my career in the nonprofit sector, uh, founding and. Um, being an executive at nonprofits and I'm on the board of a number of nonprofits. I think the core mm -hmm. lesson I've learned from India in particular is that to, and nonprofits, is that it's really important just for a second to abandon an FTE centric growth strategy. I have, you know, I think, I think for a portion of my career, I was really conditioned to believe that staff, right? Sort of FTE full-time equivalents are such an important driver of growth. Mm -hmm right that mm -hmm. and scale and an indication of how successful one will be i've sometimes actually found the reverse to be true sometimes mm -hmm. the less the less folks you've got uh it, it that that environment of constraint um requires you to think really big about strategic mm -hmm. institutional partners that are going to go to market with you um and of course um helps you control cost structure um and so for me, the biggest thing that I experienced, you know, I was, uh, I started a nonprofit alone. I was a part of a really big nonprofit years ago that had to get small. I was the only Twitter employee in India in a continental, at a continental scale for like 15 months. And so what I wow. lived in those contexts was um, I, uh, by necessity, I had to go talk to um, folks with microphones, folks who are the core protagonists of a market and find mm. really creative, inventive ways for them to take my product to market for me. Mm. Right. Um, and so, you know, often when I would tell stories about not just in the Indian market, but, you know, at Twitter, but before I left Twitter, one of the favorite things I did was I started a scout program where we didn't have full time employees, but we had scouts. Uh, who were responsible for strategic partnerships in Egypt and Thailand and Pakistan and uh, Myanmar and lots of countries where for Twitter, a full-fledged office may not make sense, but a scout might. And it was a really different way to think about market entry. But I, I think uh, mm -hmm. thinking about growth, not through the prism of staff, but through the prism of partnerships and protagonists, external protagonists has been a really big lesson for me. That's those are really interesting insights and and the whole time I'm, I'm thinking about ooh, what what lessons learned can we apply for uh, epic and so maybe we'll have some epic scouts out there um, there you go but yeah thank you thank you for for sharing this a uh, really creative approach to uh, building partnerships and it just blows my mind that you were these like only sole Twitter employee for 15 months in in India um, so Lots so, of stories. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. On a, on another day, we'll have to pull out more more of those stories from you. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, going back to uh, some of the other questions that have come through, uh, this one is actually from Arun. Um, how does the huge economic potential that India offers sit with its shrinking liberal spaces? How does the world view this phenomenon today? It's a great question, uh, Arun. You know, I, I can't, can't claim expertise on sort of uh, the latest in um, conversation and speech in the Indian market. I think the world is still part. I think what you're getting at, though, is a lot of the role I play and my business plays is educational around India. 
uh, part of um, part of the, part of a truth of all places, but particularly India, is that you have these juxtapositions that sit right next to each other, right? You, that coexist with one another. India, if anything, is a land of my favorite word for India was often coexist, right? The, not just not not only do people coexist, coexist, but conflicting ideas and notions and cultures all coexist with one another. And so I think what I would say is you're right to flag that the two things might coexist with one another and they may not be in conflict with, with one another. And I think the thing we all have to do is just be candid, mindful of, of both. I mean, I, when I talk about India around the world, I don't mince words around the complexity of India and, uh, but also the potential of India. And, it, and, and frankly, I think sometimes it's that candor, it's what drives people to your expertise. When you are mm -hmm. candid about a place's um, shortcomings, a place's failings even, um, I think it actually drives people to place. People are really interested at the end of the day in wrestling, in, in, people are nourished by succeeding in places that um, are, are complicated and by problem solving their way through a scenario. I, as an example, was at Twitter and Google and YouTube and I lived through censorship in India. I spent a lot of my time with governments, police officers from 2611 attacks in Bombay way back all the way to you know just a couple of years ago, sitting with uh, cops in India talking about ISIS, um, mm -hmm. and I, I lived the complexity of the powder keg that kind of is India in some respect, uh, but also with a with a free speech Western free speech hat on, and so um, I think I think part of what I found was that when I was honest, when I was candid, on both sides of the uh, uh, the ocean. Um, it's when it's when the most action, empathy, energy happened. Uh, so I appreciate your question. Uh, very candid, and I hope that was mildly helpful. Thank you, Rishi. Those were um, really good pieces of uh, advice. Um, and uh, I, I focused so much on Twitter today that I forgot at, at Google that you helped um, you know chip away at government censorship censor, censorship in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, so, so thanks for sharing the lessons learned. Um, so I, I want to pull out a, a question that's going to kind of expand uh, our topic today. Um, so in addition to, you know, driving all of this tech innovation, you're also, you know, incredibly passionate about politics and also uh, particularly philanthropy. So you lead uh, civic investments at the Knight Foundation. Uh, you launched Kiva Detroit. You also uh, launched Michigan Corpse with your wife, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, sort of like a social entrepreneurship launch pad. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with that as a backdrop, I know one of your friends coined the term fuzzy techie. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what does that mean? And what does that mean for you? Yeah, I mean, when people look at my career, it often feels it can feel quite zigzaggy because uh, I've been in virtually every sector possible, probably had every functional role possible. Um, but there is a through line. I, I noted earlier the importance of declaring a major. I think it's really important in our cluttered world to have a major. For me, it's place. All of my work is anchored around places and giving people new ways to see places. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I just get really high around place, whether it's my town, my country, or uh, my ancestral country, right? I love places and I love finding ways to use digital in particular to give people new ways to see places. That's that's me. Um, Fuzzy Techie, you know, a buddy of mine uh, who I worked with at Google uh, who went to Stanford, wrote a book called the, uh, the Fuzzy and the Techie. And he tells me, told me that apparently at Stanford, they um, sort of cheekily divide, there you go, Scott Hartley, you're exactly right, I know, uh, divide, uh, students into the fuzzies and the techies. The techies study STEM, the fuzzies uh, study uh, the humanities. And um, what you know, when I first came across this term, it was a big aha moment for me because I'm a history major. I studied history in college, don't have a graduate degree, don't have a technical degree, but I found my way into you know, a variety of sectors and a variety of new places and new companies that didn't exist when I was, when I was growing up and when I was in school. And I think for me, it, 
notion of fuzzy tucky really validates this idea that you can be a humanist. You can be someone who's a student of a variety of disciplines as I am, but still succeed in your discipline or in your industry or a single major you may declare in your career. Because the skills of critical thinking, the th skills of creativity, the skills of communication, the skills of getting to the essence of a deal, um, all flow from, is your has your mind really um, gone there before? And that's what the humanities teach you. The humanities don't teach you information. They teach you a way of thinking and a way of being that is useful always. And mm -hmm. so for me, this fuzzy techie book, which chronicles the history of humanists and technology, Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce is a history major. The founders of Airbnb are designers. The founder of Slack is a philosophy major, right? And on and on and on and on. Um, of course, we all know about Steve Jobs and calligraphy and his sort of interest mm -hmm. in the humanities. And so it sort of dramatizes around the world that this, what we're told around STEM equals tech is actually counter from what uh, another current, which is folks in the humanities. And so I have, I have found a particular, um, I've gotten really excited about this because in an Indian context in particular, I am even more alien than in an American context. Uh, in this, in the Indian context, you don't find many folks like me who have sort of succeeded in the Indian tech world, um, but all they've done is sort of write papers about um, American and global history, right? Uh, and so uh, it's meant a lot to me and it's helped me frame me to me. And again, when you do that, it actually attracts deal flow and partnerships and employers and commercial opportunities. That's the irony of my, mm of my life is when you invest in anything but commercial, the commercial stuff flows. I love that. I love that. I, uh, what's coming through to me is, you know, if you're authentic to, to you and right. you're fighting for something that matters, that yep. that will automatically kind of draw uh, a similar community. It may, it may take more patience, right? But when you anchor in your compass, mm. when you anchor in your own compass, at some point it'll all work, it'll flow. I love that. I love that. Um, in an earlier webinar, you know, we we had uh, sort of an automated warehouse um, uh, CEO come in, and we're talking about you know the the rise of robotics and automation and and what it means for the the future of the workforce and, and the world. And so um, it also makes me think about yep. uh, the, the larger conversations we're having around that. Right, as the world is moving into a more automated, tech-driven, AI you know powered world. Um, what does that mean for for uh, the folks that kind of don't neatly slot into those categories? Um, and one of the the larger conversations um, around that is is kind of fostering exactly what you talked about. Um, well, I think of, I think I, I tell my yeah. team uh, all the time. I'm like, try now. Some, sometimes I talk to my kids about this. Push push yourself mm -hmm. to generate ideas and work that Siri. Alexa and Hey Google <laughs> couldn't come up with, right? Mm. There, there is a day coming where software will create PowerPoint decks where even business decisions, right? Because you're going to have a data set of all business decisions ever made. You'll be able to automate so many things, right? And so the answer to all of this is to just be more human, right? We, we humans need to play to our strengths, which is be human. And what does it mean to be human? Is to be really creative. We have a lot of passion and conviction and energy. Um, those are the things that will matter more. Uh, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to have cultivated some of those things, but that's not to say it's been easy. I love that. Okay, so we might go two or three minutes over, but sure. I just spotted one more really great question that I want to pull in. Yeah. So An Lee, you asked a great one. Um, you said, Rishi, you spoke about the importance of creativity and storytelling in the digital age. Any advice on how to do so in such a diverse cultural environment? Creativity in a diverse cultural environment. Um, creative I mean, storytelling. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the quick version of it is that um, mm. is that I actually give India credit for inspiring my big question, big answer, um, mm. by which I mean creativity or creative self. You know, when I was living uh, here in the West, where I grew up from New York City, grew up in the U.S., lived in the West, so to speak, and I found myself in conference rooms that were full of lots of lots of really smart people um, working on a relatively small problem. 
when I was all of a sudden somehow decided to, you know, uh, reverse the immigration of my parents 15 years ago and check out India, it was the opposite. I was the only one in the room working on a really big question and a big problem. And that's what led to all of the creativity that for me that's um, ensued. Um, everything entrepreneurial I've done, all of my conviction, all of my counterintuitive career moves, all the stories I've told, the YouTube channels I've started, all flow from the Indian environment. And it it's by definition necessity forces you to just be thinking in big mode all day. Because when you go small in a market that diverse, that cluttered, that noisy, um, essentially you've done nothing, right? Uh, might as well not have happened. Um, and we see this with our partners all the time who'll run a campaign and the needle doesn't move. It's just, there's too much going on. And so mm -hmm. I would say that it's particularly crucial in markets that are diverse, eclectic, and frenzied to commit to big question, big answer, and creativity and storytelling at scale. Because if you don't, again, you're you're doing a um, disservice to the market and really to yourself too, um, and your own your own arc. I love that. I love that. So this is one of those conversations where I wish you know we had more time. Um, but Rishi, thank you so much for sharing all of the insights that you've shared today and your experiences, you know, expanding big ideas uh, to, to India and throughout the world. Um, and so to everyone who joined us today, thank you for tuning in. Um, you'll see a pop up in a minute to register for the next epic chat with La Galion on uh, June 16th. So they are a think tank that gathers some of the most successful tech entrepreneurs in France to work on big ideas. So the co-founder and CEO, Agathe uh, Vautier, will be speaking about responsible growth and how human and social values have become a condition to success. Um, so welcome you to, to join us then. Um, and then if I can ask one big favor, uh, please stick around for an extra you know, 30 seconds after the end of the webinar. We're gonna have a little Super Bowl commercial come up uh, where you can learn a little bit more about the pledge and how you can join uh, our community of amazing uh, investors like Rishi and, and founders who are building really cool things um, and giving back at the same time. So Rishi, again, thank you so, so much uh, for joining us today. And oh, we my, wish my you and, and the Times Bridge team um, the very best. And, and thank you again for also supporting uh, the Epic India uh, emergency campaign. We really, really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. You guys are very kind and uh, what a great community. Thanks for, thanks for having me.